Intel i9 CPUs are the cream of the crop, the Halo products that they want to upsell you to. They have the most cores and highest clock speeds to deliver on this promise of performance, and this means they use a lot of power and can run pretty damn hot. However, this i9 powered mini PC is smaller than the box most desktop i9s come in. <laughs> what could go wrong? The X-T12 Pro isn't the first i9-powered Geekom Mini PC I've looked at on this channel. A few months ago, I tested their Mini IT13, which featured a 13th Gen i9-13900H built into an Intel NUC form factor. NUC, or Next Unit of Computing, was one of those ill-advised names like artists who call themselves kid or young well past their 30s. The NUC program was ended by Intel last year, and while brands like Geekom have continued to make mini PCs as NUC replacements, they seem to be taking the opportunity to branch out from the old design. The X-T12 Pro is a new release from Geekom, but a relatively economical one. Despite its $699 price point, it now has a far sleeker, more aesthetically pleasing shell than earlier Intel-powered mini PCs, which all used the same NUC-like design for several generations. The honeycomb pattern on the base is purely form over function, but there are still real air holes around the case to allow the CPU to breathe. The CPU in question is a 12th gen i9-12900H, which is a couple of generations old now and is presumably part of the reason why this model is cheaper than the similarly spec'd Mini IT13. In terms of specs, the 12th gen i9 is similar to the 13th gen in most respects. They're built on the same 10 nanometer process node, have the same 6 performance cores and 8 efficiency cores for a total of 20 threads, and have 24 megabytes of L3 cache. The main obvious benefit of the newer chip is clock speeds, which, due to power and thermal throttling, doesn't remain an advantage in a mini PC for long. The touted 5.4 GHz of the 13900H is rarely achieved, and certainly not for more than a couple of seconds at a time and I wouldn't expect it to be any different for the 5 GHz maximum clocks in this chip. The X-T12 Pro's exterior is fairly standard for a mini PC, albeit a rather pretty one. The shell itself appears to be from the same OEM as ASUS used for one of their NUC series models, and while it's disappointing to see this isn't a completely unique design by Geekom, that particular ASUS isn't available in all markets, so it's nice that people who like this design don't necessarily have to miss out. We have a small but comprehensive range of ports. On the front are two USB 3.2 Type A's and a 3.5mm combo jack. On the rear is a third USB 3.2, a USB 2 Type A, a pair of full-spec USB 4 Type C ports capable of display output and power delivery, a pair of HDMI 2 ports, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, and a barrel jack for power. While the single Ethernet might limit the XT12 Pro's home server applications somewhat, the four total possible display outputs and ability to work with Thunderbolt eGPUs could turn this into a viable replacement for a pretty serious desktop PC. Sadly, we're missing a past staple of the Geekom Mini PC lineup, the full-size SD slots. Maybe I'm being greedy, but I'd miss having that for downloading videos from my mirrorless camera, and I wouldn't complain about not having one if Geekom hadn't already set the precedent with their previous models. Removing the bottom plate to access the interior is almost as convenient as the Mini IT series. The four screws are captive and can be undone with a regular sized Phillips screwdriver, though that is the only option. The Mini IT series could be unscrewed by hand if needed. On the inside we have more disappointments, frankly. RAM comes in the form of a pair of DDR4 sticks, and while I appreciate the commitment to a user replaceable standard, in 2024 for $700, I'd have hoped for DDR5. There's not a lot of room in here for expansion either. There's no 2.5 inch bay, which I'd already taken as given due to the form factor, but is still a downgrade from the Mini IT series. And while there is a second available M.2 slot, it accommodates the less common 2242 size drives, 
rather than the more widely available 2280s. The BIOS of the XT12 Pro is characteristically sparse, so there's no room for configuring the CPU, iGPU or memory. Thankfully, Intel makes the extreme tuning utility for tweaking CPU power limits, and I'll be using that throughout the review. In the meantime, the only meaningful option is fan control, which in the interests of getting the most out of the CPU, I've turned to the performance setting. The fan is pretty quiet and unobtrusive in operation, so that isn't a major compromise to make, but needless to say, if you're particularly sensitive to noise, it is possible to turn this down to silent, or simply leave it at stock, at the possible sacrifice of some performance. Speaking of performance, while CPU Z's built-in benchmark isn't the most useful of metrics for CPU performance, it does help illustrate the effects of power limit throttling. Out of the box, the i9-12900H in the XT12 Pro is configured to a 35W TDP and its turbo boost duration drops after a couple of seconds. Quickly enough that even the super-fast CPU Z can drop dramatically over the course of a single benchmark test. I ran the benchmark 10 times, and while the single core results were pretty consistent, the multi-core score results dropped from a maximum of 5892.3 all the way down to 3757.1. That's over a 36% drop in performance over just a couple of minutes. By downloading Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, it's possible to change the CPU's throttling behavior, extending the power limit and boost duration indefinitely. Doing so doesn't do much for the maximum performance, as it doesn't affect thermal limits, but it does help solve the issue of power throttling. The TDP now seems to go up to around 55 watts, and the margin between the maximum and minimum benchmark results is now less than 1%. This doesn't necessarily mean that using XTU is a no-brainer. There's a reason these CPUs throttle like this, and it's mainly to do with temperatures. Even at stock, the i9 can reach some scary peak temps, and lifting the limits means the CPU remains higher for longer. At stock settings, temps reach the 90s and even hit 100 degrees, but for much shorter durations. For this reason, I'm going to include numbers from both the stock configuration and the XTU tuned config for all of the synthetic and productivity benchmarks. Cinebench R23 is set up to render continuously for 10 minutes, and this shows the kind of difference extending PL duration can have on a benchmark. At its default settings, the XT12 Pro looks terrible in this test. The single core score of 1751 is about what you'd expect from this generation of chip, but the multi-core score of 6961 is pretty abysmal, sitting between a Ryzen 5 5500U and Ryzen 7 5700U, which despite their Zen 3 era names have only Zen 2 architecture. Enabling XTU sees that multi-core score almost double to over 13K. Geekbench 6 is one of the few benchmarks that doesn't seem to benefit from the extra power and boost limits, so regardless of whether using XTU or not, it scores in the region of 10k multi-core and 2300 to 2400 single core. That's a small bump up compared to the Mini IT12, which I tested with a 12th gen i7, and a step down from the i9 powered Mini IT13. But at least in multi-core, it's not looking that great next to basically every AMD powered unit I've ever tested. The GPU tests are similarly unfussed by my efforts at power tuning, scoring 15k in OpenCL and 20k in Vulkan. The i9's Iris Xe graphics are clearly a benefit over the regular old UHD graphics found in the i7, but still can't hold a candle to the RDNA graphics in a modern Ryzen. 3 d Mark's tests put a lot of stock in GPU performance, so while XTU makes a massive difference to the CPU score, it has little or no effect to the overall. In Time Spy, removing the power limits more than doubles the CPU score, but thanks to a stagnant graphics test result, the overall score difference is within margin of error. Either way, the Iris Xe once again proves its worth over the UHD graphics in the 12th Gen i7, but anything with a remotely recent Radeon puts it to shame. Firestrike is, in the bigger picture, a very similar story, however, it is a rare instance of XCU actually making the overall score worse. Mm -hmm. 
DaVinci Resolve is my video editing software of choice, so even if I'm probably never actually going to use a mini PC to edit my stuff, it's still the metric I'm most interested in. The free version of Resolve uses the GPU for rendering the H.265 codec and the CPU for the less efficient, but easier to play H.265. That means anyone looking to start their YouTube journey or just put together some videos for social media is better off choosing H.265 and the Iris XE graphics do a decent job here. The 5 minute 4K render using graded mirrorless camera footage takes just under 10 minutes, which is about what you might expect for an Intel chip in this class, but still far below the AMDs. Upping the TDP and boost duration doesn't do much, shaving less than 30 seconds off the render time. The H.264 render, however, sees a huge benefit from XTU. Without the tuning utility, the CPU throttles immediately and the efficiency cores do most of the work, leaving the render to complete in over 27 minutes. This isn't the worst I've seen. The Intels with fewer E-cores can take close to 50 minutes to do the same work. But again, the new Horizon chips run away with this one. Enabling XTU shaves more than 8 minutes off the CPU render time, and this is a great improvement. But if you insist on buying Intel and don't mind paying for the studio version of Resolve or working with the more unwieldy H.265 files, the GPU render is the faster option and is less likely to cook your PC in the long run. Blender is another app which benefits massively from using XTU. Left at stock settings, the classroom scene renders in 14 and a half minutes, relying again on those efficiency cores that means it completes the task in a far shorter time than the 12th Gen i7. Dropping the safety limits on the CPU means the P cores continue to shoulder the burden and that almost halves the render time to 7 minutes 24. My gaming results were all done with XTU tuning enabled, but as games are heavier on the integrated graphics, this CPU tuning has proven to have very little effect in the past, so results will be similar at stock. Starting with Apex Legends, at 900p low with temporal anti-aliasing, the game comes close to a 60 average, though there's enough stuttering to make this a pretty unpleasant experience. Technically, this is on par with the other 12th gen mini PC I've tested, but it's still a bad time, and one of the reasons why I wish they'd chosen DDR5 instead of DDR4. Battlebit Remastered plays a fair amount better at 1080p potato settings, allowing it to reach a fairly smooth 90-ish average with lows over 60. This is about 15% lower than the Mini IT12's i7 achieved at the same settings, though as with all large-scale games with numerous different maps, it's hard to say for sure if this difference is due to the hardware or the game. The first title not to give a surprisingly low result Counter-Strike 2 at 1080 low with 100% resolution scaling gives about 75 FPS on average in deathmatch, putting it on par with the 13th gen model, which has the same iGPU, hence why it's not that surprising. It's pretty far from a pro-level experience, naturally, but it's fine for casual play, and given how popular CS2 remains, I suspect that covers most players. Fortnite is always a shocker on Intel iGPUs. Something about drawing graphics and CPU processes from the same Intel chip just takes an already stuttery game and makes it intolerable. This was my second match, though results were no more consistent in my first or third ones either. Averages at 1080p in performance mode were great, coming close to 90 FPS. 1% lows were a war crime. Overwatch 2 was disappointing. I only saw an average of just over 50 FPS, mainly due to the terrible frame pacing. I think some res scaling's in order here, because otherwise this just isn't a tolerable experience for a competitive game, especially one with small, highly optimised maps. Mm -hmm. 
One thing I often like to do with these mini PCs is see how well they handle older games. Given how much people like to complain about new releases these days, I thought maybe there'd be some mileage in testing out some equivalents from the past. The original 1990s Tomb Raider series just got a remaster this year, and while the only complaints I've heard have been regarding the so-called modern controls, I'm sure someone somewhere will have a problem with it. However, I can't be asked to put myself through tank controls again, so I loaded up Tomb Raider Anniversary. This game is now old enough to drive in the UK, so perhaps it's no surprise that the Intel XE graphics are fairly unchallenged by it. Still, I dropped to 900p as it was the closest 16x9 ratio resolution option, and it was still smooth as butter, but uh, for some reason the RTSS overlay didn't work. The original Star Wars Battlefront 2 also recently had a remaster, and it's going tremendously. On the off chance you don't want to subject yourself to the various issues this new classic collection is suffering from, the original version still works just fine. The XT12 Pro is actually a little underwhelming here, as I had to drop to 900p and reduce some settings to keep consistently close to the 60fps cap, particularly on ground-based maps but it probably still looks and plays better than it did on PS2 or GameCube. Finally, I can report that Dragon's Dogma 2's terrible optimization is not a new or unique phenomena. Dark Arisen, the remastered PC port of the original Xbox 360 and PS3 game, doesn't stick to the 60 mark either, even though neither the CPU or GPU are being maxed out. If I'd taken the time to check out the PC Gaming Wiki page, I might have been able to optimise it for myself, but I was running out of time and needed to get the video wrapped up. In conclusion then, I'm disappointed but unsurprised. While I understand Intel CPUs are still popular with some customers, and there's probably software out there that still works better on an i9 than a Ryzen equivalent, in general I can't see a reason to recommend the XT12 Pro. The main selling points of Geekom's previous Intel powered NUCs have been the small details like 2.5 inch drive options and the SD card slot, but those have been sacrificed in the name of shaving a few millimetres off the height of the units. Despite the new design, there's no discernible improvement to thermals or power delivery, and despite the $700 price tag, there's no DDR5, which means that even in gaming, an admittedly fairly niche use case for this type of PC, there's nothing new here that you couldn't get from the older models. There's a link to the XT12 Pro in the description if you think it might fit the bill for your needs, but for me, the bottom line is, if you absolutely need to buy an Intel powered mini PC, this isn't bad, but it isn't the best, even from the same manufacturer. If you're not married to the Intel brand name, then there's a whole bunch of better options, even from the same manufacturer. You can get a Ryzen 9 powered model in a similar looking chassis with better expandability that will beat the XT12 Pro in almost every test, and costs not much more. My review of that PC, called the A7, is linked on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.